with an unrealistic view of what life in the armed forces was all about. This is how military life looks in the army's latest gritty recruitment video. But are slickly produced images like these misleading young people? Now teachers accuse army recruiters of targeting youngsters in school with devious marketing they say amounts to propaganda. Spot the amendment to get the military out of our schools? At their annual conference, teachers claim the Ministry of Defence glamorises life in the army, promoting the opportunities for travel and training, ignoring the realities of war. Join the army and we'll send you to carry out the imperialist occupation of other people's countries. Join the army and we will send you to bomb, shoot and possibly torture fellow human beings in other countries. When I see the MOD putting out recruitment material saying that, then maybe I won't have a problem with using it in the school. Until then, I think that all recruitment material is misleading and should be opposed. In the end, teachers voted overwhelmingly to campaign against military recruitment in school. The army says it does not actively recruit in schools, rather in advice centres like this. But it does visit around a thousand schools a year, but insists that's to raise awareness of the military and is not recruitment propaganda. Supporters of the military have condemned the National Union of Teachers. The Conservatives call their opposition a kick in the teeth for soldiers on the front line. The Ministry of Defence said it was disappointed. It shows a misunderstanding, really, of what the army is doing when it visits schools. It's not just about recruiting, it's about educating young people about what the army is all about. And to, uh, to try and prevent that, I think, is a shame. Potential recruits can sign up as young as 16, though they can't take part in military operations until they're 18. The numbers joining has fallen in recent years, so what do young people themselves make of the army's recruitment techniques? I thought it was really helpful. Uh, it's, it actually prompted a couple of guys to sign up for the army and a couple of them who were thinking of it to reconsider. They only say the good stuff about like the training and everything and yeah, they don't say anything about death or nothing. You are so well done, dang it! The army won't be excluded from schools, that's up to individual head teachers. But opposition from Britain's largest teaching union will fuel a debate about how the army is presented. James Westhead, BBC News in Manchester. Well, David Lukic is a 16-year-old student from Yorkshire. He's in our lead studio to talk about the experience that he had when the RAF came to his school. Uh, hello to you, David. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us this evening. Uh, just tell us about what happened to you. You were a musician and uh, you were told that the RAF were giving a concert at your school. Yes, that's right. Um, all the, the, we were told that the RAF band would be coming to give a concert to everyone at our school and that afterwards that, that we would be able to pose questions to them about life in the RAF. So what actually happened? Um, well, we had the concert and then they explained to us that they're all full RAF officers and then we were directed towards an RAF recruitment officer who would answer our questions about life in the RAF. So do you feel that uh, you were slightly misled? You went there just expecting to enjoy the music and maybe ask a few casual questions and this was a, a proper recruitment uh, evening? I do feel, feel like I was slightly misled and I felt that all the um, images that were presented to us during the concert were very positive because there were many posters up around the hall showing the RAF officers like, completing marathons and being generally happy and there weren't any negative aspects of, um, of the RAF life being shown or even talked about at the concert. So they didn't discuss the dangers of war and, and what could possibly happen in a worst case scenario? No, and I feel like it would be important for young people to know the danger um, of joining the RAF because of the length of time that they'd be away from the families or the stress that, that they might suffer as a result of joining the RAF. Um, and I think that it glamorises it slightly when it shows young people these positive images that they could be influenced by. Do you think forces should be allowed to talk to young people about uh, what goes on and uh, the dangers of the job? Because, I mean, they do need to know, don't they? Yeah, I do, I do feel that Army officers or RAF officers should be able to talk to young people, but I feel that they should give a balanced viewpoint, the positive and negative aspects of joining the RAF or the Army or the armed forces in general. So you don't have a problem as such with people uh, talking to you about the, uh, military service, but it's just the way it happened on that particular occasion in your school? Yeah, I think that the, pot the portrayal of how they present the RAF or the armed forces should be balanced. However, um, if only giving positive as 
aspects might encourage young people to sign up, only for them to realise that that they would um, that they might have made a mistake after signing up. Okay, David Lukic uh, joining us from Leeds. Thanks very much indeed for uh, sharing your experience with us. Well, let's uh, continue the conversation. Let's speak to Peter Caddick Adams, who's a defence analyst. He's there in our Oxford studios. Uh, fascinating to listen there to what happened to David. What's your take on this? Did the NUT have a point? I, I don't think they have a point at all. In fact, their position to me uh, makes no sense at all. Um, if they're worried about uh, armed forces personnel going into schools and glamorising the business of soldiering or serving in the military, then who better to talk about the other side of the coin of people wielding guns, of the misery of refugee camps uh, and war and peacekeeping than soldiers and, and sailors and uh, airmen uh, from the armed forces themselves who've witnessed this and seen this. Uh, and they're far more likely to be able to give a balanced viewpoint in answering questions of students and pupils than perhaps posters on the wall. But you, you, absolutely implicit in that is your assumption that those people who go on those visits will actually do that. You've just heard a long account there from one youngster who said it was not like that at all in reality. Well, I think, I think the key point here is the questions the students themselves are asking. Um, and we need to see this also in a way... Surely the responsibility shouldn't be theirs to determine what is right and wrong on this. No, but um, students are going to ask questions and they're going to get a range of answers from people who've had some positive, some less positive experiences uh, serving on operations abroad. And, and, and let's not remember that uh, this isn't simply the business of sending people overseas on operations in, in a fighting role there's a wide range of skills that the armed forces offer army navy and air force male and female uh, and what you're doing really is is offering part of the whole careers guidance business to schools of, of offering alternative careers to young people um, from the age of 16 onwards but it is misleading isn't it to, to have these speeches these days to have sometimes recruiters there or certainly guide youngsters and students to recruitment centres and then stand back and say, hey, this is not a recruitment exercise. I mean, it, it's pretty close to that. It, it's a pretty blurry line, isn't it? Uh, I don't think so at all. I think the moment you go into schools, what you're doing is offering young people advice about potential careers. And if we look at this in the wider context, you get uh, the police uh, and the fire services, the fire brigades going into schools as well. And I believe the armed forces should be seen uh, in that context. Uh, this is offering a profession in a risky business where you put your life on the line. And sure, there's a glamorous side, uh, but uh, equally just as much, if not more so, uh, there's a debit side where um, the lifestyle is unpleasant, there are risks, you spend a long time away from your family and plenty of police and fire well, service Well, just on that, a, a final that point well. then, on, on exactly that, uh, is or should the onus be, if these uh, visits uh, go ahead, should the onus be on those military personnel to go through all of those things you have just talked about because we heard there about posters, we've seen the adverts that uh, show travel, show skiing. Should the onus be on those military personnel making sure they go through all of the negative aspects of what it is like to actually be involved in warfare, what it's like perhaps to be injured, what it's like to actually come back to perhaps a hostile climate? Well, of course, the big point is there that only a certain fraction of the armed forces will have been through that themselves so you can't ask a recruiting officer to talk about something which he or she hasn't personally experienced but what they can give you is can't be a that hard to find people who actually go out to schools to do that is it I, I, well, recruiting takes a particular skill of empathising with young people and you don't want to just send anyone into that particular role. You want to, to field the, the best spokesman uh, to go into schools. And in that way, I think you're doing schools a big service. And it's up to the schools to invite uh, members of the armed forces in uh, as part of the career, careers guidance business. Uh, and it's a shame that the NUT, in some ways, I think, are marginalising themselves. They could play a very positive role in this about what uh, the armed forces can do in the international okay. arena. Peter Caddy-Adams, thanks very much for your time. Thanks a lot. Yeah.